For this video, I have decided to portray one person's road to becoming a kindred through an abusive and exploitative relationship. My intention is to show that many vampires, especially those who are very good at pretending they're not, are by their very nature manipulative. Given enough time, age and experience jades most of them to the point where they no longer really see humans as people, which is a common theme for this setting. So with that in mind, let's begin. Jacob Cartwell recently got the position as an SEO and social media intern at a small West Coast talent agency. He's from out of town, although from where changes every time you ask, but like many others he came to California in pursuit of a career in the entertainment industry. And in just a few months he's helped boost the online presence of many of his agency's clients and he's already rubbing shoulders with some pretty famous influencers. Jacob's also secretly a street artist and his works, under the pseudonym of Destiny, can be found all across the western sea border. He's been doing it for a good four years now and it's been earning him some recognition within the graffiti community, enough that he's even had a couple of his pieces featured in Blank Slate, one of North America's biggest street art magazines. Jacob has been chosen by Jeanette de Moon de Cariac, the local Torador primogen, to become her latest progeny. Jeanette is looking to expand her domain online and has concluded that social media may be both a reliable source of revenue and of clan prestige. But having been born in the 18th century, Jeanette has a rather tenuous grasp of how the internet works. Jacob is the perfect candidate to teach her and his artistic talent is the cherry on top. Jeanette has approached the local prince about embracing Jacob despite having three other children already. Since Jeanette is not just a primogen, but also Toreador, a clan with great influence in this particular part of the US, it doesn't take much more than that, and a few subtle threats, to convince the prince that she is in the right. Toreador are considered the artists and socialites of kindred society. They, more than any other clan, tend to embrace the creative souls, hoping to capture that spark for themselves. But for some reason many kindred gradually lose this creativity that so much define their mortal lives, growing stale and unimaginative. It's no wonder then that so many of them flock to California, hoping to sate their taste for what undeath has taken from them, in a place where talent comes cheap and plenty. So with the prince's permission obtained, Jeanette sets her plan in motion. Within a day, Jacob loses everything his job, his friends, and his future, as he's publicly arrested on charges of willful destruction of public and personal property, as well as burglary. He spends a night in jail, is booked, and then told to appear before court at a later date for his sentencing. Jacob does not make that appearance, vanishing that same night, and a month later a report is quietly filed of a John Doe dragged out of the local river. The body is later identified as being the missing Jacob Cartwell, but only through matching dental records, as the body is too badly decomposed to otherwise be identified. Being nearly 300 years old, Jeanette has learned to leave very little to chance. Now, not only has Jeanette severed many of the ties that might compromise her hold over her future child, but she has also made sure that he will feel forced to remain under her protection. Should he attempt to reveal that he's actually alive, he will most likely be facing time in prison. For Jacob, or Destiny as he now calls himself, Jeanette appears as a helpful Samaritan. She provides him with food, hospitality, and a genuine interest in his art, and what follows is a month-long period of careful grooming. Destiny slowly begins to warm to his mysterious benefactor, all the while she carefully studies him, performing her final evaluation before she decides if he is a suitable candidate for the embrace. Destiny's growing affection is also strengthened by the small amount of Jeanette's blood that she is feeding him creating within Jacob an artificial desire as she turns him into her ghoul. This blood bond, if performed repeatedly, can be so strong that a thrall may even kill themselves should they be facing the threat of isolation from their regnant. The blood also has a mildly intoxicating effect, and during this time Destiny creates some of his most creative and wonderful art pieces. It is an intensely emotional and vulnerable period in his life, which Jeanette takes full advantage of. And when finally the time for his embrace comes, it seems romantic to Jacob. After a night of deep conversation and a pleasant dinner, although Jeanette isn't very hungry, the two make love. But in the cusp of their passion she drains him of blood and feeds him a small amount of hers in return. The process of death and rebirth is a powerful experience, potentially the single most potent any kindred will ever experience. Pain mixed with pleasure, and many kindred recall seeing a light in the distance as they arrive at death's door, only for it to be snuffed out as they are janked violently back to consciousness. Waking up after the embrace is similarly traumatic. The small amount of vitae that their sire was willing to share is rarely enough to slake their newfound thirst. 
and if there is no readily available source of more, they will enter a state of frenzy, attacking anyone or anything in sight in order to satiate themselves on their precious blood. This is called succumbing to the beast, and for a kindred this will be an ever-present threat for the rest of their existence. They are no longer prey, but predator, and their very nature has changed to reflect that. If it is not sated, the beast may rear its ugly head at the most inopportune moments. After the embrace, the relationship between Destiny and Jeanette quickly deteriorates. He is now her progeny, and whatever amicable side she showed him before is rapidly replaced with the cold and demanding true nature of his vampiric sire. He is an object now, a tool for her to grow more influential. All the while, Destiny has to come to terms with these new truths about the world and about himself, realizing and ultimately accepting that there is no going back to the way things were. And with the effect of the blood bond still in his veins, he can't even bring himself to hate the woman who did this to him. In fact, Destiny will come to the horrible realization that he, in many ways, is now incapable of truly feeling anything. Ghosts of emotions may still pass through him, but the energy, the life that once possessed him, is gone forever. Instead, he will feel empty, and as time goes on, he will find it harder and harder to relate to the mortals he once belonged to. He will shun the places he used to visit, where he may run into people from his previous life, and even if he desires to reach out to his family, fear of putting them and himself in danger will stay his hand. Only the hunger drives him now. It is always there, always reminding him of its presence. It will be Jeanette who will teach Destiny how to hunt and how to behave. The fourth tradition of the Camarilla demands that until he is acknowledged as a neonate by the prince, he is Jeanette's responsibility and it falls upon her to make sure that he does not threaten the masquerade. Jeanette will of course personally ensure this before she introduces him to the prince, but other sires might not take as active a role. They might instead guide their childhood from the shadows, or not even help them at all, seeing it as a form of final test to ensure that they have what it takes to make it as a kindred. And somewhere in all of this, Destiny has to do what he was chosen for. Unsurprisingly, educating a centuries-old vampire in the workings of social media soon proves itself a fruitless endeavor, and he is instead left in charge of managing things as her interest quickly veins. Paradoxically, he has given more freedom and power than ever before in his career, managing his sire's vast assets. Yet it comes with a gilded cage in which he'll stay until she considers his work done, if it ever is. This is just one of the ways that someone could become a kindred. Every embrace is unique. But rarely is someone ever embraced without reason. A lover may be embraced so that eternity will feel a little less lonely, a friend might turn another to spare them from a life-threatening disease, a stranger might need more bodies for their cause. In the world of darkness, every additional vampire created is another potential rival for prey and power. Your character's embrace might never become a topic of discussion in your game, but it can serve as a powerful tool in forming your character's views of undeath, mortals, and of course their sire. Vampire the Masquerade can be played in a lot of ways, and in my opinion it's important to always have a dialogue about your expectations for it. In any role-playing game, ground rules and consent are important to ensure that people feel safe and comfortable playing, even more so in a horror game where you are playing the actual monsters. Try to be mindful of the themes in your game and what your fellow players are comfortable with. For my next video, I'll talk a bit more in depth about the Camarilla and its traditions, as well as what Destiny's first encounter with the sect might look like. After that, we're going to be taking our first in-depth look at a clan. Thank you very much for watching my video. If you liked it, consider joining my Patreon. For just a dollar a month, you'll be able to vote on topics for upcoming videos, join the Discord server, and have your name in the credits of my videos. So, until next time, stay safe out there. Gehenna might soon be upon us.